Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for i5 for the iPhone is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. Hello, everybody. This is i5 for the iPhone, episode 110. This is the show where we cover the latest iPhone apps and tips and tricks, and of course, news. I'm Sarah Lane, and I'm now the proud owner of an iPhone 6 Plus. That's right, bitches. 128 gigs of hugeness. Really big right here. It's a whole new world, so join me, won't you? Number one. OK, so let's actually talk about the 6 Plus, which is you know 5.5 inches on the diagonal, which is much bigger than the regular iPhone 6, and certainly a lot bigger than the 5S that I'm so used to. It's the biggest phone that I've ever had, ever. So, my first impressions are really first impressions because I've only had the phone since Monday. But I have to say that the iPhone 6 Plus is huge and if I'm being honest, it's too big for me. I mentioned last week that I have pretty small hands, so that's definitely a factor. If you have large hands, maybe it doesn't seem that big, but I really have to try extra hard to sort of juggle it around doing all the things that I used to do with my iPhone 5S. This was all very easy. Take for example the gym. I was at the gym this morning. The 6 Plus doesn't fit into any of my pockets. Can't really tuck it into my sports bra. That's weird. And I feel ridiculous carrying it around because people are kind of glancing at it. In a purse, not a problem. But again, actually using it out and about seems strange because I feel like I'm using a phone made for a giant. Good thing I rarely talk on the phone because, you know, that looks kind of silly, too. But enough about me. Mac Rumors ran a story Tuesday that some 6 Plus owners were sitting on their phones in back pockets, stuff like that, and finding that these iPhone 6 Pluses were bending. Now, call me crazy, but unless you, like, really like your clothes loosely fit, this phone is not designed for pockets. Yes, it's very nice and thin, but it's not malleable. It's not made of super material. What do you think is going to happen if you sit on it? Don't sit on your big, thin phone, people. Mac Rumors points out that even with the 5 and the 5S, people actually complained about bendy phones occasionally. Never happened to me, but I also don't have room for phones in my pants, skinny jeans. Again, I've only had the 6 Plus for a couple of days, but I think my initial advice is do not buy this model unless you're either coming from a phone that's already 5.5 inches, Galaxy, something of equal size, and so you're used to it, or you spend some, a good amount of time handling one, go to an Apple store or you know, hold your friends or anything to really understand how big you're scaling up. It pains me to say this, but I should have gone with the six. I'm gonna stick with the plus though, because it's a learning experience and who knows, I might come around. Number two, so here's a little duh tip for those of you who want a little bit more control over how Apple tries to understand your typing habits. Predictive text is new in iOS 8. It's not new to mobile OSs. I remember back in my Nokia days, like a decade ago, there were phones that could handle predictive text. I don't really know why it went away, actually. The idea, though, is that the phone predicts what words and phrases that you want to type based on how you've constructed sentences in the past, which can be really helpful. It can also be very poetic and nonsensical, but let's, you know, that's for another day. Let's say that you're not interested and you just want predictive text gone. That's not a problem. One option is to selectively hide your three text predictions by pulling up or down on that area of your screen. But if you want it truly gone, you want, actually want to just toggle it off altogether, you can press and hold the keyboard icon to turn it off. By the way, this is also a new and improved, much improved way to toggle between your other keyboards that you might have installed. I never really liked pressing that keyboard icon over and over. It always felt janky and half the time I'd accidentally start using my French keyboard and that was kind of a mess. So. Good work here, iOS 8, much improved. Number three, speaking of keyboards, keyboards are kind of a big deal these days. One of the coolest additions to iOS 8 is the ability to load third-party keyboard apps onto your phone. Apple denied its users this for many years. It's a system customization, and Apple's not really ever into having us customizing stuff on the system level. 
but you use your keyboard all over the place. So this is a big change on Apple's part. Apple used to want to control the quality of your experience. Today, we've got more options. So let's look at a keyboard app Android users have loved for a long time, Swift Key. Yeah, you thought I was going to say swipe. Swift Key. Installing is a two-step process. You actually install the app itself, and then you have to add Swift Key in your keyboard settings and then allow it full access. Now here's where it gets awesome. You know how the iOS caps lock is super annoying and you never really know when something's about to be capitalized because all the keys are shown in capital letters? Gray and white, Apple, that's not enough. What were you thinking? Well, SwiftKey uses upper and lowercase letters. It takes a little getting used to that design, but it makes it crystal clear what case you've chosen. Or how about the drawing method, where you actually draw lines to link words in a sentence. Now this looks to me like an insane way to type. I've watched people do it on Android for some time and I thought, oh, they're just being different for the sake of being different. Nobody wants this. But it's actually really accurate. It's scary accurate. I really like this feature. I'm going to practice. You can also hook up SwiftKey to your Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Evernote accounts. That way it has a deeper history of how you already communicate and can predict words more accurately for you. Some people are going to be a little bit weirded out by this, and they totally have a point. You're putting trust in a company to have access to all of your correspondence and not do anything bad with it and not get hacked. And there's no 100% guarantee of either of those things. You have to just go with your comfort level on this one. SwiftKey also supports multiple languages, not all of them, but I have the option to ditch my stock French keyboard, for example, and then use SwiftKey's version, quand je suis prêt à message text. The app is free, by the way. This episode of i5 for the iPhone is brought to you by Gazelle. Are you thinking about getting the 6 Plus? Maybe you think, you know, my hands aren't really that small. I'm ready to go in. Gazelle wants to buy that iPhone that you don't need anymore. In fact, even if it's broken or kind of in bad shape, Gazelle will buy it then too. Gazelle makes selling your used iPhone fast and simple. You just go to gazelle.com, that's G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, and tell Gazelle the condition of the item you have. Broken iPhones, iPads, not a problem. Gazelle will give you an offer for your gadgets, a risk-free offer that's good for 30 days, and then you get paid fast by check PayPal or get an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. Do it now, though, because gadgets may lose value the longer you wait. Gazelle is great because you're paid in cash, the payment is fast, it's risk-free, Gazelle will even wipe your data for free. You know, everybody's scared these days. Gazelle wants to help you, wants to be trustworthy. The company has paid nearly $175 million to over 1 million customers. Free shipping, most items even qualify for a free box. That is a no-hassle situation. So what's your iPhone worth? You want the new iPhone, right? Take a minute, go to gazelle.com and find out. But do it now because your gadgets lose value the longer you wait. And thanks to Gazelle for sponsoring this episode of iFi. Number four. So here's an interesting duh tip that we got from Chad, who lives in Lewisburg, North Carolina. Louisburg? Chad writes, I've heard lots of people talk about how they wish the new Hey Siri feature worked on iOS 8 without having to plug in the device. Turns out that you can kind of do this by simply holding down the home button and then activating Siri. Once it's activated, you can lay your iPhone down and Hey Siri will work hands-free without being plugged in as long as Siri is active on your screen. Hey Siri, where's the nearest pizza place? I found quite a few restaurants pretty close to you. Okay, so this is a, it's kind of an interesting little trick. The whole idea behind activating Siri with Hey Siri is that you're able to be hands-free, right? But the whole point of having your iPhone plugged into power is also to save battery. Because if Siri was not plugged in and constantly waiting for a prompt from you, your battery life would drain way too fast. Nobody would like that experience either. But Chad's little workaround hey, does work in those instances, whatever What's they may be, price? where you don't have power, but you want to use this feature anyway. So you activate Siri, today, and then you talk to her when you feel like it. Cents. Chad's right, it does work. It's not really designed to be used this way, but it does work. Number five, finally let's talk about a big old app redesign from Google. Google loves iOS, what can I say? Remember Google Currents? It was basically the company's version of Flipboard. Well, it's been renamed to Google Play Newsstand, kind of keeping it in line with Google branding everything else, Google Play something. And it's also been rebuilt from the ground up, so it looks really different. You still have access to breaking news and articles featuring not only text but audio and video. Support for hundreds of publishers covering sports and business and cooking and entertainment and so on. 
Read Now is brand new, though. You can use it to easily access articles that you subscribe to and also discover new articles in one place. You can subscribe and get news from topics that you're interested in. You can manage all your current subscriptions in My Library. And of course, you can bookmark anything that you don't have time for to go back and read later. It is very much Google's answer to Flipboard, even though the name has changed and it looks a little bit different, still works very similarly. You know, it's funny, Flipboard was always my go-to on the iPad, but I never liked the experience on my iPhone. It just was too small. I wasn't crazy about the way that uh, the pages uh, uh, flipped vertically to advance articles. Just felt scrunched. Now that I have a 6 Plus though, which will henceforth be known as Biggie Plus, by the way, I might like Google Play Newsstand and other reading-centric apps a lot more. I sure hope so anyway. And that does it for this episode of i5. Hope you had a good time. All the apps and links and other information from the show is at twit.tv slash i5. You can email questions or general feedback to us at i5 at twit.tv. Leave us a voicemail at 614 on i5 or even send us a video. I'm Sarah Lane and we'll see you next week on i5 for the iPhone.